Hi everyone, it's Angela with Propella Cure for Crohn's Disease. We're so excited to bring you number six in our continuing series of interviews with world-renowned experts whose work is relevant to Crohn's disease. In this video, we're going to be talking to Dr. Kevin Tracy, who is CEO and president of the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research with Northwell Health in New York. Dr. Tracy is a neurosurgeon by training, but he is also a specialist in inflammation and its role in our immune system. He was a pioneer in the identification of TNF in this process, as a matter of fact. In this video, Dr. Tracy is going to be talking about the exciting world of bioelectronic medicine, including the use of electronic devices that control the signals and nerves between the brain and the immune system. This work has such exciting potential for better treatments for Crohn's disease both in safety and in efficacy. We hope you enjoy this video. Thank you for watching. Hi, and welcome to Propella Cures video series. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Kevin Tracy from the Feinstein Institute in New York to discuss with us bioelectronic medicine. And with me today are three board members, Natalie Emery, Al Fliss, and Ildiko Mayas. And I am Annabelle Hall, the founder of Propella Cure. We are an all volunteer nonprofit supporting Crohn's disease research. Take it away, Ildiko. Thanks very much, Annabelle. And Dr. Tracy, once again, thank you so much for being here today and being willing to speak with us today. I am so excited to speak with you. I know we all are. And I just want to start off by having you talk about your background, because I think what a lot of people watching this video won't know uh, about you is that you're a neuroscientist. And here we are talking about Crohn's disease today. So I, I want you to help us make sense of that. and. Tell us all about your really, really interesting background and the amazing discoveries that you've made that ultimately are, are relevant to what we're discussing here. Oh, th thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So yes, I'm a neurosurgeon uh, who has been studying inflammation for almost 40 years. Um, the, that's not a that's not a very sort of typical combination of, of jobs, neurosurgery and immunology or inflama inflammation biology. But it, it, it happened because when I was training uh, to be a neurosurgeon in, in New York at the New York hospital, um, I, had, I, knew it, I knew even then that I wanted to spend a career combining science with medicine or science with neurosurgery. Um, but I didn't have a particular area of interest um, just getting started out. Um, but, but then a, a little girl died in my arms, literally, at the New York hospital. She, she had been a, 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 an accident victim from, from a kitchen accident. She, she had, was 11 months old and her name was Janice and she crawled under her grandmother's legs as her grandmother was cooking dinner. And when the woman turned to drain a pot of boiling um, pasta water into the sink, she tripped over Janice and, and the boiling water um, scalded Janice over 90% of her body. And so uh, this little girl um, really had almost no chance of survival when we met her, but she was a little miracle baby. And after a month, she had made one recovery after the other. And we were starting to think that maybe she'd actually go home. Um, but she suddenly went into shock and died. And while well, I stood there and, and held her <clears throat> and, and, and we couldn't explain what, what had happened to her. Uh, there was no, there was no scientific reason or medical reason that that should have happened. And all of the explanations um, that we could come up with had to do with toxins causing shock and, and toxins from an infection or toxins from a bacteria. But we, she didn't have any infection. She didn't have any, we didn't find any abnormal bacteria to explain this shock. And so that I decided, I decided then, and it was, it was uh, May of 1985 
uh, to work on the problem of what, what could have killed Janice. And uh, I've been studying it ever since. Um, it turned out um, that my colleagues and I at Rockefeller University, which is next door to the New York Hospital and at the New York Hospital, um, identified the, 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 the toxin that killed Janice wasn't made by bacteria, it was made by her own immune system. And at the time, no one really imagined that the immune system would make molecules that could be so dangerous. Uh, and the molecule turned out to be a molecule that, that patients with Crohn's disease today know as TNF. And, uh, and what we discovered was that uh, when the immune system inappropriately makes TNF, uh, that, the, that rather than do the things it evolved to do, which is coordinate um, antimicrobial responses, facilitate wound healing, and, and mobilize um, met metabolism around infection and injury, too much TNF actually can kill. And too much TNF made chronically, as can happen in, the, in, in Crohn's disease, can cause the damage to accumulate in the intestines and other tissues that are the problem in Crohn's disease. So my colleague and I in 1987 um, wrote the, the first publication, did the first experiments in Nature, a journal called Nature, which showed that monoclonal antibodies against TNF can stop inflammation. We were, we were studying baboons. We weren't studying Crohn's disease. We were studying this problem of shock. And uh, the publication of that paper was, was the start of, of what, what today is the, the biological basis for Remicade and Enbrel and, and, and many other biologics. It was, uh, it was and, 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 and that's, that's, that's what I've been doing since 1987 is trying to understand if the body can make a molecule like TNF that can be so dangerous, then how is it... How, how, how is it normally controlled? Why do most people not have chronic overproduction of TNF healthy? In health, TNF and IL-1 and other cytokines are controlled very, very carefully by, 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 by the brain as it, as it so, in 20 years, 20 years after, after, um, after Janus, my colleagues and I made another fundamental discovery that signals carried from the brain to the immune system control how much TNF is made. And that really holds what I hope is the future for treating Crohn's disease and other inflammatory diseases using electronic devices to control signals and nerves. Yes, so I, I'm glad you touched on a <laughs> lot of really important points there. Your um, observations and discoveries around TNF, and you mention, and and you're quite right, in Crohn's disease, uh, Remicade and Humira, which are anti-TNF drugs, are our mainstays of therapy. But you've also talked about how you've sort of moved beyond that, um, which I think in Crohn's, you know, we now have a few different mechanism of action with with other drugs that have been more recently approved, but we haven't moved far off. Uh, that initial concept of trying to really blunt that TNF response. And I just want to mention for people watching this that you did a TED talk um, a number of years ago that hopefully people can go and view on YouTube. And you said something in that that I thought was really important and interesting that I'm hoping you can comment on and, and maybe more specifically with Crohn's. But it says, if you don't understand, you said, if you don't understand the mechanisms, you can't solve the problems. And I think that's a really, really important statement and, and very much how we all think about Crohn's as well. We think about it in terms of trying to understand the mechanisms, which are so incompletely understood right now, or even I would say poorly understood. So I guess my first question to you uh, before we talk about vagus nerve stimulation is do you have a theory about the mechanism or the pathogenesis of something like Crohn's disease? And I know you work across other inflammatory diseases as well, but do you have any thoughts or, or theories on those mechanisms? I do not have a I do not have a good answer for uh, the mechanism underlying Crohn's disease. Um, the, 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 
there, I know there's a, I know a number of the theories uh, involve um, something starting uh, inflammation, which later becomes the problem. And so when you come in with treatments that target inflammation in some patients, you can get very significant benefit. Uh, but in other patients, those same drugs targeting inflammation seem to confer a little benefit. So no, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know the, that anyone knows the fundamental mechanism uh, that's causative in Crohn's disease. I think part of the problem may be that Crohn's disease may be actually many diseases. Um, and the same, of course, is true of all sort of colitis. You know, when I went to medical school uh, in, the, um, in the early 1980s, we were taught that, that, that there are very different diseases and the following reasons. And now we see that it's more of a spectrum. And, 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 and when you have a spectrum of a diseases that there's not a consensus agreement on what is the cause, then it, it raises all kinds of questions. Of, well, how many, how many diseases might it be that look mostly similar, but are actually quite different? And, and ultimately you come down to questions about what's the contribution of genetics and what's the contribution of environment, what's the contribution of both. And that's another very, very complicated area. So no, I don't have, I don't have a good answer to that. Although I would propose that, um, that, 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 that you know, we don't even know in the patients who get better from taking anti-TNF, why they get better. Um, you know, there are, there are, cases for, and this is true, not just for Crohn's, but for many of the autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases, you can have an anti-TNF antibody, pick, pick a brand and, and give it to the first patient and, uh, and, and, and she doesn't get better. But then you take a different brand of an anti-TNF antibody and you try that and they do get better. That makes no sense as a scientifically because they, uh, the scientific mechanism should be from blocking TNF and they should both do that. They both do do that. So then why does one work and not the other? No one knows. Uh, no one knows why TNF levels, and I say TNF, but it could be IL-1, IL-6, IL-8, other cytokines. No one knows after 40 years what TNF cytokine levels mean in a patient at a given point in their disease. I mean, you would have thought by now we would have been able to connect the dots a little better on the amount of cytokines being produced in the tissues or, or their blood to, to, to make biological sense of it. But we haven't, we can't. And part of that is because within a given patient, the, the, it's, it, in bi it's a fundamental principle in biology that when you turn a system on, if you wanna regulate it the most, at the same time you turn on one system, you turn on the opposing system. So it's insulin and glucagon, it's, 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 it's uh, clotting and fibrin fibrinolysis, it's, it's wound healing and wound destruction. These things all happen at the same time. And in inflammation biology, when you turn on inflammation, you also turn on anti-inflammation. And so, so in order to understand what's going on, you have to understand both. And we just don't, we don't understand we don't understand those systems as well as you might think from watching commercials on on Sunday afternoon football games or golf tournaments. Um, so so that that's that's really true, and it, it's a segue really to we're just beginning to understand how the nervous system controls the inflammatory system or the cytokine system, and we know what we know we know a lot. Um, we know a lot more than I thought we would know 20 years ago, um, but we still have a long ways to go. And um, it, it seems quite clear that in some patients with autoimmune or autoinflammatory diseases, the neural signals controlling the cytokine system in the vagus nerve actually become impaired or fail before the inflammation starts. So it really is a, it's a fair question. It's a question, not a, not an answer. It's a question that warrants further study, but it is Crohn's disease and, and rheumatoid arthritis and related conditions of auto inflammation and autoimmunity. Are they, are they downstream of problems that originate in the nervous system? It's possible. It's very possible. So to the extent that we don't understand the mechanism 
of what starts the disease, what we, what we have come to understand is that by hacking into the nervous system or, or, or stimulating the vagus nerve, it's a very powerful way to turn off the, the cytokine cascade, the cytokine storm. And, and it offers some advantages, um, theoretically anyways, over monoclonal antibodies or biologics. Because if you, if you stimulate the vagus nerve, which can be very safely done with, uh, with devices that have been put in a quarter of a million people already for many different indications. But when you stimulate the vagus nerve, you actually don't just block TNF. Excuse me, I'm gonna cough, I'm gonna unmute. The vagus nerve evolved to to, to lower the magnitude of the cytokine burden, the cytokine storm from a toxic level to a healthy level. Monoclonal antibodies block things to zero. So, so we don't, we're not seeing immunosuppression from vagus nerve stimulation, but we are seeing the, the lowering of multiple cytokines. So a patient with a little bit too much TNF and a little bit too much IL-1 can be very, very sick. But if they're both lowered into a healthy range, um, they, can get, they, they can get a lot of relief or, or, or potentially 100% better. And we've seen this with patients with serious Crohn's disease uh, who were implanted with vagus nerve stimulators in Europe and as part of a clinical trial that a company I co-founded called Seven Point uh, ran. And we've, we've had people now in a long-term re remission after having an implant of a vagus nerve simulator months and years later. And, and really amazingly, not every patient responds, of course, that, that's always true. Um, but some patients didn't respond to the vagus nerve stimulator and then were able to respond to biologics when they went back on them. Um, so there's, some, there's a lot more for us to learn, but I'm, I'm quite hopeful that vagus nerve stimulation will find a place in the future treatment of, of, of these diseases. Yes, um, so let me, let me step back a little bit and, and dig into, again, you said so <clears throat> many interesting things. I, I have lots of questions in my head. Um, so first of all, can you very briefly just tell people who are watching this what the vagus nerve is and how you go about stimulating it? The, the vagus nerve is a, is a, is a cranial nerve, which means it, uh, it arises in the brain stem, the, uh, at the base of the brain, sort of between your ears, down low, and, 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 and it projects from the brain to the organs of the body. There, it's a paired structure. It means there's two of them. There's one on each, each side. They call it the vagus nerve, but there's actually two. And and these two vagus nerves travel down each side of the neck into the chest and then across the chest through the diaphragm and into the abdomen. And it touches most of the major organs of the body. It, it carries signals from the brainstem back and forth. So from the organs to the brainstem and from the brainstem to back to the organs. And, and these back and forth signals form the basis of reflex circuits. And these reflexes are the, are, are the signals that operate all day long for the organs that you never think about and can't really feel. But your brain and these, in these reflex circuits is the information for your brain to know how your kidney's doing, how your pancreas is doing, how your spleen is doing, and all the other organs. And so, so for, for many years, the vagus nerve was studied uh, for its ability to, for instance, slow, slow down your heart. So when you, when you're, when your heart, when you, when you're exercising, uh, and, and stop exercise, your, your heart speeds up when you exercise to deliver blood to your muscles. But when you stop, it has to slow down again. The signal to slow it down comes in the vagus nerve and it's a cardiovascular reflex to keep your heart within balance. And so this is true for many, many organs, and this has been known for 100 years. But un until my colleagues and I asked the question about 20 years ago, no one, no one ever really thought the immune system was controlled by reflexes. And we said, well, maybe it is. And maybe TNF is controlled by reflexes in the vagus nerve. 
And, and when too much TNF is being made, um, or when a lot of TNF is being made, say early during an infection when you need it, maybe that, that the production of TNF is, is being detected by the brain, by the nervous system in the vagus nerve. <clears throat> and then that reflex is a signal going back down the vagus nerve to stop TNF production. And that, that's what we discovered to be true. Uh, we've written um, many, many dozens of, of papers scientific papers in the peer-reviewed journals on this idea uh, we published with hundreds of co-authors. Um, we, we, we've, we've raised tens of millions of dollars to study these questions. And we have very good answers to how this works now. And it puts us in a position to build electronic devices to turn on the signals in the nerve to turn off the cytokines, TNF and IL-1 and IL-6. So can you tell us a little bit about those devices? I understand that, you know, they've evolved over the years. As you said, there are patients who've been implanted, presumably with some older models, some newer models. I think there are now also some external devices. Can you comment on, you know, the, the different types of devices out there and, and what your research shows about, um, you know, kind of the benefits of those devices and also where those devices are going as you continue to research it? So uh, the, the devices that have been um, used historically for decades to stimulate the vagus nerve uh, were implanted in patients with epilepsy. And uh, more than a quarter of a million patients uh, have been, have been uh, treated for, for epilepsy that was poorly controlled by drugs by having a device which is like a, like a pacemaker um, implanted under the skin uh, in the chest and then a, a lead a wire uh, tunneled up to the vagus nerve in the neck. And that worked pretty well. About half of the patients have, have, have a 40%, something like that, have significant benefit to control their seizures with this device. Um, the devices that are being developed now for inflammation for inflammatory conditions have not yet had FDA approval. Um, there, there have been clinical studies done with that other device, with the other devices used for epilepsy and just they have to be reprogrammed, however. Um, this is really important. Um, the, the devices for epilepsy operate continuously, on for five minutes, off for five minutes, 24 hours a day. But for treating inflammation, um, we're seeing significant clinical benefit by, by treating for a total of between five and, and, and 20 minutes total a day for the whole day. And there's, there's important reasons for that that I won't get into, but it has to do with the half-life of the response from blocking cytokines. It lasts a long time. Um, so so those, those clinical studies are happening uh, as we speak. There's also... Um, Setpoint Medical, the company I said I founded in California, is running clinical trials in the United States for rheumatoid arthritis patients using a device that's no bigger than the tip of your little fingernail. And um, that device is implanted right on the vagus nerve in the neck. It has a uh, built-in, has a battery. It has an ASIC, a computer chip. It has leads, and it has an antenna. And it's controlled by a tablet. So the, the patients will have this implanted. It'll be about 20 minute uh, procedure, my, uh, my, relatively minor procedure, um, probably by a neurosurgeon. And then uh, once for life is the idea because um, the device will be charged by, by wearing a collar for uh, once a week for a couple hours to charge the battery. And, and the device can be is fully programmable through an iPad interface that the doctor uh, can reset, uh, you know, every month or six weeks or eight weeks, as is as as is decided with between the doctor and the patient. So that I think is the future. Um, the, those trials are happening as we speak. It is not yet FDA approved. Um, it would if it's if if it's successfully approved for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. I can all but hope that it also gets studied in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, this would be my wish. I wish they were studying it in inflammatory bowel disease already. Um, but, um, but I think that's the future. I think the future is you'll have 
I think patients in, in the future will have a choice between um, trying a, a host of different drugs that may or may not work and, and or trying a, an implant on their vagus nerve uh, or doing it together. So you mentioned there have been some studies on this to date. Can you tell us a little bit about those studies that have been done? Like, what do we know so far specifically in IBD? Um, so I was not a co-author on the IBD study. So I, I, I like you, know what I've read. But it, to me, the, it looks as if the data are quite, um, um, uh, are quite encouraging. There is evidence that patients who have um, not had clinical responses from steroids and, uh, and other non-biologic agents, um, something like two thirds of them seem to have a fairly good clinical response from just having the device implanted. And in patients who have been on biologics, um, but whose the effectiveness of the biologics was incomplete, um, looks like about half of those patients have some significant clinical improvement from having a vagus nerve stimulator implanted. And as I said earlier, uh, there's more news there because some of those patients, even in the group that doesn't have a good clinical response from vagus nerve stimulation, still gains benefit because when they go back on biologics, they, they, with the vagus nerve stimulator implanted, and now they have, now they have a clinical response. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, my, when you add in the rheumatoid arthritis patients that have been treated with vagus nerve stimulation, my estimate is there's still less than 100 people in the world who have um, had, uh, who've been participants in clinical trials for this idea. But um, as far as I can tell, at least half of them have some sort of long lasting clinical benefit. So that's pretty darn good. It is good. And, and of course, these days, um, and you alluded to this, when we're talking about therapies and Crohn's, we're trying to figure out which therapy is going to work for which patient. And going back to your earlier point of probably many different diseases. So I guess one question I have, and again, maybe this is just uh, hypothesizing, but do you think it's possible that, say, Crohn's disease patients who also have some kind of inflammatory arthritis together with their Crohn's disease might be the phenotype of patient that might benefit from something like this? Or is it just, you know, too early to prognosticate about those kinds of things? Yeah, I could, I, I could only speculate on that. I, my guess would be as, as good as yours at this point. Um, I think when you follow the data, what we know is that a significant number of patients benefit from a particular cytokine inhibitor, IL, uh, TNF inhibition, IL-1 inhibition, or IL-6 inhibition. And when you look at what, how vagus nerve stimulation works, it, uh, the mechanism of vagus nerve stimulation is to suppress the overproduction of all of those, plus other cytokines maybe that we don't even know haven't been discovered yet. So when, when, when you, when you ask, when you ask, you know, how, how is, how, how, how is the universe assembled and, and, and what does what, and, and you reduce it to first principles, uh, we know as a first principle that cytokines cause inflammation and that inflammation causes the symptoms of Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis. And we know that the cytokine quantities being produced is being controlled by the vagus nerve. And we know that we can control the activity of the vagus nerve in people and in animals. So I'm betting that we are going to see the uh, approval of these devices in the foreseeable future uh, as a treatment modality, whether it will help half of the patients, a third of the patients, or most of the patients remains to be seen. I think it's going to help at least half. That I would bet on from the data we've seen so far. And there was a pediatric study recently as well. Is that correct? Were, were you involved in that study? Uh, I, I, the one in uh, Sweden? Um, was it in Sweden? I think there was one in Florida. Could that be? I, oh, I, should, well, have, I should have looked it up to, to remember exactly who conducted it. Um, so I am aware of a, of, of a pediatric inflammatory bowel disease study. Uh, I believe it's Crohn's disease. At, uh, at Cohen's Children's Hospital, which is, which is part of the Northwell Health, Net, Health um, 
in New York where, where I am. I mean, the Feinstein, I'm the president of the Feinstein Institutes at Northwell Health. Northwell Health is the largest um, uh, healthcare provider in New York City and state. And we have a children's hospital called Cohen's Children's Hospital. We, there, there, there is a, uh, a recently completed clinical trial there in pediatric Crohn's disease, stimulating the vagus nerve through the ear. Uh, so this did not require surgery. And right. uh, that, that is the one I'm talking about. Thank you. Sure. And th- th- that's a very interesting study because, uh, first of all, it's in children. And as you know, uh, um, most of these biologics and other powerful drugs that are used in pediatric Crohn's disease w- were never actually tested in formal pediatric clinical trials. So, so there's a need there. Um, it's also interesting because it is possible to stimulate the vagus nerve, we believe, uh, using uh, electrodes held on the external ear. And that's, that's because there's a branch of the vagus nerve that goes to the cartilage of the external ear. And my colleague here, Dr. Ben San, um, studied uh, the question of whether stimulating the ear with with electrodes, like you'd find in a, in a TENS unit you can get on Amazon, uh, whether those um, devices activating the vagus nerve of the ear of these children would, would lead to improvements in their symptoms of Crohn's disease, and it did. Um, their, their Crohn's disease clinical scores improved and, um, and, and their uh, fecal calprotectin levels improved. So there's tremendous interest in repeating that trial uh, it was a small study. I think it was about 16 or 18 um, children. And now the question is, would those, would those results hold up in a larger trial? And would they be associated or not with endoscopic healing? That remains to be seen. Yes. And I'm the parent of a child with Crohn's. So these are things that are very interesting, not just to me, but I think to a lot of caregivers in our community, um, as well as obviously adult patients as well. And, and particularly the notion of, of, yes, just using an external device could be really interesting if that's something that's ultimately found to be successful. And this may be a, a, a kind of silly question, but you know when you look at, you go down the rabbit hole of vagus nerve stimulation on the internet, you find a lot of um, techniques like breathing exercises and yoga and you know everything from, from singing to, uh, you know, uh, other activities that can have an effect on, on the vagus nerve. Is that, does that have any, you know, credible science behind it in your view, or, or is that uh, really maybe, maybe even if it does just insufficient when you're really talking about something that's as, as that has progressed to an inflammatory state like Crohn's disease? Well, I, I think every patient's different. And, and I think as we learn a lot more about um, what's going on in the vagus nerve in specific patients with specific inflammatory conditions, we'll be able to provide more specific answers. As a general um, statement, um, there, there, there are ways of, of quote unquote stimulating the vagus nerve uh, with you know, cold showers, with um, mindfulness training, with aerobic exercise, uh, which you know chronically slows the heart and stimulates the vagus nerve. And you can go right down the list. Uh, the, the question remains for a specific patient with a specific condition, will, will those things work? And the answer is we don't know. Um, you know, the, the physiology of, uh, of the vagus nerve is very, very complicated. There's about 80,000 or 100,000 fibers in each vagus nerve on each side. So it's a very complicated communication sort of superhighway. And it's very possible that the the, the fibers of the vagus nerve controlling your heart could be totally fine. And uh, there could be a problem in the fibers going to your immune system and you wouldn't necessarily know it. So I'm wary of generic statements about strengthen your vagus nerve or strengthen your immune system or that kind of blah, 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 because it's complicated. I mean, you may very well want to have a strong immune system, but I don't want to have a 
too strong of an immune system because too, too much of an immune system can cause Crohn's disease. That's what too much TNF does. So, so um, it's complicated. That being said, um, as a general guideline, it, um, I think if, 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 if you're a patient with an inflammatory condition and your doctor is not opposed, um, careful aerobic exercise, yes, try it. Um, cold showers, yes, try it. Mindfulness training, meditation, I do that. Yes, try it. I mean, I, I, under, the, under the permission and guidance of your physician, these things I, I would think uh, would warrant careful assessment. But, as a, but, you, but we don't know enough to make a, a general recommendation to a population. Yes, that, that absolutely makes sense. It's good advice. So I, I guess my, my last question to you, and then I'll open it up to the other members here is, you know, the future plans. I say every time we do one of these videos, I say that we are impatient. <clears throat> I think patients are impatient, no pun intended, but caregivers, parents, I, I would say we are kind of next level impatient because it's our kids we're talking about. And you know, I know that a lot of this is complicated and takes time, but I'm also a big believer in that complex problems can be solved. And, you know, just look at all that we've learned and accomplished about COVID over a you know, very short period of time, uh, including therapeutics and vaccines in under two years. So I'm a believer that there are solutions here. And I guess my question to you is what can we do to accelerate um, getting answers to some of these as yet unknown, some of these things that still need further study, what, what's kind of the major challenge that you face? And what is it that you would hope, um, you know, could help you to answer some of those questions? Well, I, 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 would, I would say, as, as, I, as, as your colleagues and I discussed in, in New York when they visited, um, that there's a very specific need uh, that could be fulfilled by your foundation and other patient advocacy groups, and that is patient advocacy. I mean, the, this, will, this will continue to progress. Um, the science continues to march forward quite, quite quickly, actually. It's going very well. And the business interests around bioelectronic medicine to develop new therapies is, uh, probably has a market cap worldwide of between one and $2 billion. There's a tremendous interest in this happening. So, so I don't, you know, that's, it, it, it's going to require some more time and some more money and, uh, and some more work, but, it, but I'm quite confident that, the, that it's an inexorable path now and it will, it will be met. What, that's going to that's gonna create a new problem that you can be involved in, which is um, once this thing is proved to work, it will not be quickly adopted unless patients scream and demand for it. And in the history of medicine, um, going back to the guy who invented hand washing, Ignaz Semmelweis, uh, and was uh, ridiculed and scorned and, and imprisoned by his peers um, who accused him of being um, mean-spirited um, by, 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 by blaming the, the doctors and the medical students who were doing autopsies without gloves and then without washing their hands, going in and delivering babies uh, costing the lives of the babies and the mothers, um, those same people accused Ignatz of, of ill will uh, by blaming them for not washing their hands. So, so it was hun it, it's been a couple hundred years since poor Ignatz died, and, uh, and there's evidence that caregivers still don't wash their hands enough. And um, so, so what drives this um, what drives medical innovation at the end of the day is patient demand. Um, physicians have not been trained in the concept of, of implanting a chip in the neck of a patient with an inflammatory condition. They've been trained to write prescriptions. They've been trained to, um, to order uh, scans and they've been trained to run down checks lists of biologics to see if they could get a combination that worked. They have not been trained to send the patient to a neurosurgeon to implant a chip in their neck. And that is going to require a, uh, a cultural shift. And it's gonna, and, it's, and it, whether it's Mary Tyler Moore with diabetes 
or the HIV activists marching on Tony Fauci's office 30 years ago in Washington, or uh, the pink ribbons the NFL football players wear for breast cancer. Patient activism is going to drive this, and we're going to need uh, the Crohn's community is going to need going to need your activism. Um, I think once this proved is proved to work to get it adopted, um, so that we can all um, live to to see the benefits of this. Thank you for that that call to action, and um, we're right there alongside you, and and hope to see positive data and FDA approval, and we will absolutely uh, help to advocate for it. Then, um, does anybody else have any questions? Thanks, Ildiko. I have a question, and thanks again, Dr. Tracy. You mentioned earlier that um, Crohn's disease, IBD, is likely many um, different diseases within a spectrum. Within that spectrum, we know that we have mild, moderate, and severe. Um, depending on where someone falls along that spectrum, is something like vagus nerve stimulation something that you see reserved only for the more severe um, severely affected individuals, or could this be something that could be adapted to a milder um, Crohn's disease presentation or a moderate Crohn's disease presentation? Yeah, the latter. Um, I, I, I would, uh, to the extent that mild, moderate, or severe uh, inflammatory conditions are caused by inflammation, which they seem to be, then, it, then it, it's quite plausible or reasonable to believe that the earlier intervention um, to control the excessive inflammation with a vagus nerve stimulation, for instance, might actually prevent the, the progression of the disease from mild to moderate and moderate to severe. You know, I, I just would clarify when I said it may, it, it may be many, it may be many different diseases, there's two, there's two kinds of spectrum, right? One is the progression from mild to moderate to severe, that's a spectrum. But then there's another one, which is where two patients that look like they have the same clinical disease actually have a different disease caused by a different mechanism, two different genes or two different, what if it turns out to be an infectious agent, right? It, one, one patient could have a have infection with one agent that causes Crohn's disease and another with a different agent that causes Crohn's disease. They would technically be two different diseases. But to the extent that these things progress through inflammation being the problem, which is what the overwhelming evidence is now, as of today, then yes, I think vagus nerve stimulation could be significantly helpful. And what I'm really, um, you know, we named that when we started set point medical, we named it set point, like the set point on your thermostat to set the temperature in your, in your heating and cooling system. And, and our hope, our dream was that we could learn enough science one day that by, by reactivating the vagus nerve in patients whose vagus nerve is, is impaired or diseased or damaged, that by reactivating it, we could restore a set point. We could restore the brain's ability to um, maintain the immune system normally once again. That would be called a cure. And if we can actually do that. And I will tell you that um, I am aware of several patients who are walking around with, previously with decades of disability from Crohn's disease who are now walking around symptom-free and not taking any, any medication. And one of them asked me, Am I cured? And I said, maybe, I don't know. How do we know? Ask your doctor. I think that may have been the same patient whose doctor told her he didn't believe that the vagus nerve stimulator was helping her. So this is the real world we're living in. And uh, yeah, I, I, I do think intervening early across the, the spectrum of disease progression could be really important. Wonderful, thank you. I have another question about uh, every medication, every therapy has risks versus benefits. And earlier you said that vagus nerve stimulation is much safer um, than what the current treatment modalities that we have now are. Are there any risks associated with vagus nerve stimulation that you have observed so far? So the, as I said, um, 
we don't know enough in a Crohn's population, Crohn's disease uh, study population, we don't know enough about the risks and benefits of this because there's only been a couple dozen people so far studied. And we'll have to study hundreds or thousands before we can definitively give a risk benefit assessment for this therapy for that condition. But we do know the risks of vagus nerve stimulation itself, because as I said, about a quarter of a million people have, have had vagus nerve stimulators implanted. And, and in general, it's quite safe. Um, in, in the hands of a skilled surgeon, the major risks are infection or nerve injury, and those should be almost zero uh, if done by a, by a skilled surgeon who's, who's skilled in the, that art and, and at a good facility. I mean, um, some, some patients notice uh, when, the, when this electrical stimulation is firing, that if they're talking like I am, that their voice will change while the electricity is flowing through the nerve. But as I said before, if that's, that's for epilepsy patients when the device is on 24 hours a day with five minute uh, intervals every five minutes on and off. Whereas for inflammation, it may, we may get to the point where the device is only on for five minutes twice in the middle of the night while you're sleeping. And then I wouldn't imagine the patients would even be aware of it, which is, that's my dream. But we have to do a lot more work to do and a lot more patients before we know all that. But in general, I, I do not uh, anticipate that there will ever be a black box warning for uh, vagus nerve stimulators as there is for many biologic agents today. Great, thank you. So Dr. Tracy, um, how, Clearly, we need to have trials um, mm. to have this be uh, approved by the FDA. How do we get this to happen? Because right now, there are no trials going on at the moment in the United States for this. Um, so what do we need to do? Um, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, the the, um, the, the um, in order to do a clinical trial, you need 10 or $20 million and a device that's FDA approved to be implanted in patients. So um, we can just hope that the companies developing these devices uh, progress towards testing, testing them in Crohn's disease. I'm personally very in favor of that. Um, and uh, I'm rooting for any and every company to test this idea in Crohn's disease, whether it's by implanting devices uh, on the vagus nerve, whether it's by stimulating the vagus nerve non-invasively with either ultrasound technology, which you can do uh, by targeting the spleen, or by, as we talked about before, continued work on stimulating the vagus nerve in the, in the ear. What I want to see is I want to see this idea, which my colleagues and I thought of 25 years ago, I want to see it being used in patients. And that requires um, progressing through the, through the steps of uh, under under uh, scientific rigor and 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 ethical and FDA regulatory oversight, uh, the the proper development of these ideas. That's what I want. I want the proper development of these ideas. And uh, I know that um, uh, that I share your. Um, you should know that I share your impatience. Uh, I wish I wish this was going faster. I wish I could snap my fingers and make it go faster. I've been trying to do that for 20 years. I don't know how to make it go faster. Would, um, would, would approaching people in Washington help? The senators, congressmen, that sort of thing? Um, I mean, you, sh you should make them aware um, because we're gonna need them at some point, um, but, but they don't have a device to put in. People, we need, we need clinical results, we need data. And the data requires a clinical trial, the clinical trial requires a sponsor and a device. So what I hear you saying is that right now, step one is clinical trial of the device itself, not for a particular indication, but presumably mm -hmm. more so from a safety perspective. And I guess efficacy would be stimulation of the vagus nerve. Um, and no. then the next step beyond that is indications. No, 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 no. As of now, um, Setpoint Medical is doing 
a, a clinical trial using a device they've already implanted in patients to prove its safety, and now they're testing its efficacy. They're doing it for rheumatoid arthritis, not Crohn's disease. And, and if, if, it, if, it, uh, if it proves to be successful in rheumatoid arthritis, which will take another year or two, then one might imagine that they or someone else would then have to do a similar trial for Crohn's disease. We know this can be done safely. What's needed are a series of efficacy trials for devices in a specific condition with a specific patient cohort under FDA guidelines. And those things, that's, what, that's what's needed next, FDA approval. Right, understood. And, and what phase are those trials in, in rheumatoid arthritis? So, um, for device trials, they don't go by phase one, two, three, but you could think of this as a phase two, three type trial if it was a drug. Got it, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Al, did you have any questions? You're on mute. Sorry, um, I, th I mean, I like it. You know, it's it's something that seems to be safe, and and I've gone through. I mean, I've had Crohn's disease, you know, for you know, part of my life, and something that's safe, you know. I mean, it's something that I don't have to worry about, you know, you know, being exposed to over a number of years that is, you know, puts undue burden on me is is tremendously attractive. But like you said, the challenges are getting clinical studies, getting getting the money to do the clinical trials to actually go on these particular indications. And I think that is, that's a, that's a pretty, that's a reasonably sized hurdle. Yeah. 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 And it's, and it's a process that's controlled by the company. So that's. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But to your well, point, I'm optimistic that if there are positive data in rheumatoid arthritis, that the next step will be a trial in IBD. Yeah, because that's the proof of concept, really, in inflammation. I think. I mean, that would be that would be the proof of concept. Right. Right. Well, you know, I, I hope so too. I think um, I don't control those decisions or those steps, mm -hmm. but you know, scientifically, uh, if if uh, if if devices are made available for for human clinical testing and other diseases, I think you'll see a lot of clinical trials for a lot of inflammatory conditions. Well, thank you so much for educating us about mm. bioelectronic medicine. This truly mm. is a, a new frontier yes. and a very exciting one and uh, not new for you. You've been working in this for 40 years, but for many of us, this is new. So thank you for, for all of your hard work and the education. And we really hope to see this become a reality and we'll be right there alongside you advocating for it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for all you do. And I, I wish you really good luck in your mission as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.